Good afternoon or good morning from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. My name is Miriam Stark and I am the director for the Center for Southeast Asian Studies today. And it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's session, uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Randall DeFalco and Professor Taeong Beck from H. Manoa's William S. Richardson School of Law. And uh, they will speak about uh, the legacy of the Khmer Rouge Tribunal in Cambodia. I'm turning this over to Professor Beck. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Taeung Beck, a professor of law and the director of the Center for Korean Studies. Welcome to this very important webinar. I'm very happy to moderate today's session hosted by the Center for Southeast Asian Studies. We have a prominent expert of the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia, Professor Ender de Falco, as today's speaker. Dr. de Falco joined the William S. Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii and Manoa in 2021. Prior to joining the University of Hawaii, Professor de Falco completed his doctorate at the University of Toronto and a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Liverpool. After graduating law school, Professor DeFalco spent approximately two years researching issues of international criminal law and transitional justice in Cambodia as a Fulbright Fellow and legal advisor affiliated with the Documentation Center of Cambodia, a local NGO dedicated to the pursuit of truth and justice for Cambodia's recent history of atrocity violence, especially during the Khmer Rouge period of 1975 to 1979. Render's publication touching on issues of post, uh, post-conflict justice in Cambodia have appeared the International Journal of Transitional Justice, Genocide Studies and Prevention, the Fordham International Law Journal and the Southern California Interdisciplinary Law Journal. His book, Invisible Atrocities, was published by the Cambridge University Press in 2022. As you know, the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia started its function, former function in 2006 and has concluded its activities in December, 2022. As a hybrid tribunal with a Cambodian national staff and international staff, staff meaning prosecutors, judges, lawyers, and others working together, it well demonstrates how international criminal law and tribunals have evolved from the day of a Nuremberg tribunal and Tokyo tribunal after World War II, former Yugoslavia and Rwanda tribunals, and to the time of the International Criminal Court. Today, Professor DeFalco offers us an opportunity to learn from the experience of a hybrid Cambodian tribunal. He will talk about uh, 45 minutes, and then we will have a questions and answer uh, a session. So if you have any questions, please type your questions on the Q&A uh, tab under this uh, webinar setting, and we will uh, follow up with the questions. I may ask uh, some of you, uh, to speak later on directly if we had time, if we have time. So please do not leave after asking your question if possible. Thank you again for joining this wonderful webinar and please welcome Professor Tifalco. Render, the floor is yours now. Thanks a lot. I'm just gonna quickly share my screen. Um, which I think worked. Um, all right, so. Uh, thanks for that kind introduction. Um, thanks to Professor Stark for um, inviting me and the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I'm um, looking forward to presenting uh, uh, a bit of an overview of the of this court or tribunal and uh, a few thoughts on one component of legacy. Um, so what I'm going to do today, um, and thanks to Taeyong for the very kind uh, presentation. So what I'm gonna do today uh, is I'm gonna hopefully open up space that we can have a discussion about legacy 
um, by discussing how legacy can mean, you know, different things to different people. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview uh, about the background of the court, how it came to be, um, some of the basics of jurisdiction and the cases that it had. Um, and I'm going to use that kind of general overview, as well as a kind of whirlwind historical um, primer as an entryway into a discussion about a specific concern I have, um, which concerns the relationship between the court's legacy um, and legacy in terms of its the court's relationship to the rule of law in contemporary Cambodia. Um, so to properly contextualize both of these issues, kind of the contemporary rule of law in Cambodia, its lack and, and where that came from, as well as it, the, um, the court's approach to some of its cases and some of the concerns I have about rule of law uh, implications thereof, um, we have to kind of look where we came from in a general sense, um, before we get into some more specifics. Um, so I'm going to give this whirlwind historical backdrop, um, and then I'm going to give a brief overview of the court, its jurisdiction, some of the cases that it have, and that that point I'll shift to a kind of framing of the legacy um, and how the questions around legacy are framed. And I'm going to look at how, among other things, um, the court um, has been framed as um, expressively and kind of in a quote unquote capacity building function, um, being an institution that could only have positive effects for the rule of law in contemporary Cambodia. Um, and that's the assumption that I have some concerns about um, and which I have critiqued in the past. Um, so I'm going to explain how um, I view that in light of increasing use of what can be framed as or referred to as rule by law tactics by the Cambodian government and its democratic backsliding, um, that these rule of law concerns raised are not necessarily completely insulated from the ECCC experience. Um, and then I will specifically look at cases, the very controversial third and fourth proposed cases of the court, which ultimately never moved forward and uh, talk a little bit about my view on how the closure of the cases may have negative effects um, both for um, the rule of law in terms of the, the norms being expressed um, to the Cambodian population domestically, as well as what I refer to as the possibility of quote unquote negative capacity building. Um, all right, so. Um, a little bit of background for many of you. I know this is going to be just kind of like very 101, um, but it, I, I'm hopeful that it will be come clear why it's important to look all the way back in some ways to the Ancorian Imperial period um, to understand where Cambodia's contemporary rule of law deficit um, kind of comes from, right? Um, Cambodia is a country in between. Um, Thailand and Vietnam in Southeast Asia that was um, many years ago, about a thousand years ago, the seat of a powerful empire. Um, and that empire over time um, is famously remembered for the Angkor Wat and other temple complexes in the Siem Reap area, but there's temples throughout the country. Um, <clears throat> over time, the power of that empire waned and eventually um, the territory now known as Cambodia uh, became subject to incursions on both sides. Um, so on one side from Thailand and the Siamese Empire and from Vietnam on the other side, which at that point were much larger um, and more populous, more powerful countries, which led to um, the colonization by the French, right? So in a, around 1863, um, a series of treaties were entered into with the French, um, which facilitated um, Cambodia becoming part of French Indochina. And um, this is important, I think, because the story that's often told about rule of law deficits in contemporary Cambodia kind of starts with the Khmer Rouge and this notion that this during this terrible time, 
all the lawyers were killed, um, save for maybe a few, um, and legal professionals were wiped out, as well as um, Khmer language um, textbooks and legal sources, right? Um, in my view, one cannot look at the rule of law situation in Cambodia without going back to the imperial period, um, because what happened was the, that the French set up a, a kind of dualist legal system um, that was much more developed in terms of collecting taxes and um, extracting wealth um, to return it to the metropole from Cambodia while leaving other areas of law neglected, underenforced, uh, and without the space to develop over time. And so what was the result was in 1953, when Cambodia eventually achieved independence, um, that was not a period of particular stability as well due to the wars going on in the region and many different political factors that I can't go into right now, but I'm happy to discuss further. Um, but my broader point is that Cambodia did not have a kind of stable period through which it could develop its own um, indigenous legal system, right? Um, free from external pressure. You have this massive gap from the 1860s um, kind of right through till after the Khmer Rouge period. Um, and I think it's important to think about the, the, the scope and breadth of what was lost in terms of opportunities to develop um, an appropriate, um, truly indigenous legal system in that country. Um, and that's a major void to fill that I think is often overlooked when, um, you know, folks say, oh, yes, the ECCC can improve the rule of law in Cambodia. Um, because I think it underestimates um, the scope of the problem and views it as simply imposing a kind of um, liberal Western um, approach to law um, on Cambodia. Um, and I think the problems run much deeper than that. Okay, so with that very general background, um, a quick primer on the lead up to the Khmer Rouge period and then the creation of the court. Um, you know, after independence in 1953, there's lots of um, conflict in the region. Um, you have the first and second Indo-Chinese War, the second one being popularly uh, referred to as the, the Vietnam War in the U.S. And from 1965 to 1973, the U.S. was heavily involved um, in uh, a, a secret, illegal, and um, quite obviously criminal in terms of war crimes and crimes against humanity, bombing campaign um, throughout Cambodia. Um, uh, and this led, uh, during this time, there was a coup. Um, the Lun Nol, uh, who was a general in the Sihanouk, uh, Sihanouk's uh, army, um, there was a coup while Sihanouk, um, the king and later prince and head of state, um, Nordon Sihanouk was in China at the time and there was a coup. And then that led to a civil war from 1970 to 1975 between the Lun Nol regime and a kind of coalition of rebel groups. Um, at this time, there was many different fighting groups, but they kind of coalesced um, or, and were eventually taken over by the Communist Party of Kampuchea, um, which is more popularly known as the Khmer Rouge um, because they were branded the quote unquote Red Cambodians um, at the time. So there was atrocities committed by all sides during this very brutal civil war. Um, and essentially, the Khmer Rouge progressively controlled the countryside, while the Lun Nol regime remained um, in control of cities, principally Phnom Penh, and was increasingly reliant on the U.S., um, especially for food aid, in order to continue. So the U.S. abruptly pulled out in 1975. Um, and here we have a map of bombing sites um, based on declassified U.S. information. Um, this is put together by Taylor Owen and Ben Kiernan. Ben Kiernan's a relatively well-known um, historian of um, Cambodia. Uh, this is put together at Yale. Um, and just to show that there was mass atrocities before the Khmer Rouge period, um, and this will tie, I'll tie this back in when it comes to questions of jurisdiction um, at the court and some of the controversies at the court. Um, then with this kind of whirlwind backdrop, we have the Khmer Rouge sweeping into power on April 17th, 1975. The U.S. Uh, abruptly pulled out. And in that vacuum, um, the Khmer Rouge regime forces had already kind of encircled 
the Capitol and they swept into power. Um, the first thing um, they did was to close the country. Um, many former Lunnall officials were executed um, and they enforced a nationwide system of communal living um, and wherein those conditions were incredibly harsh. And as the regime progressed, there was also a successive series of purges um, where um, internal and external pur purges, wherein many um, members of the Khmer Rouge were purged in different regions. Um, and there was also significant civilian purges. Um, so the death toll during this period um, from 1975 to January 1979 um, is not is subject to a lot of debate. Um, and is essentially unknowable for various reasons um, of bad demographic data going in, bad demographic data afterwards, uh, many different factors. I'm happy to talk about that if anyone's interested. But the generally cited um, death toll is somewhere between 1 and 1.7 and 2.2 million um, people out of an approximately 7 million um, person total 1975 population. Um, there were some demographers who were hired by the court um, to review different um, estimates of death tolls, as well as breakdowns in terms of direct cause of death. Um, and their estimate was that there was a roughly 50-50 split, split um, when it comes to direct cause of death between um, kind of direct forms of violence, so executions and the like at prisons. Um, and um, things that can be loosely characterized under the umbrella of living conditions. So the enforcement of famine conditions, working conditions, overwork, lack of sanitation, um, unchecked spread of disease, um, et cetera. Um, and so there was many questions that lingered. Um, there was the genocide question. Um, this is often referred to as the Cambodian genocide. Um, however, um, the legal definition of genocide doesn't neatly map on to um, much of the violence in this um, in during this period, and I'm happy to talk about that further as well. That became an issue of controversy at the court, um, but there were particular groups um, aside from uh, ethnic Khmer Cambodians um, who have been found by the court to be um, victims of genocide, including the Cham Muslim population and Vietnamese Cam Cambodians. Um, so the court, um, started operations in 2006. Um, so there's this question of, okay, the Khmer Rouge were ousted from power in January of 1979. They were ousted, um, through a military invasion by, um, Vietnam. There had been border skirmishes between the, um, Cambodian, uh, between Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge and Vietnam. Um, there was growing animosity um, between the Vietnamese and um, Cambodian uh, communist parties. Um, there was a view um, repeatedly expressed by Nunchia throughout the trials that um, amongst the Cambodian communists that the Vietnamese communists were kind of treating them as secondary citizens. And there was a fear that Vietnam and the Vietnamese com uh, sorry, communist party uh, was planning to set up and dominate a quote Indo-Chinese Communist Party. And so there's this kind of growing animosity with um, skirmishes and some atrocities on both sides, um, largely Cambodian incursions into Vietnam. Um, and Viet uh, Vietnamese forces invaded in January 1979 um, and ousted the Khmer Rouge um, from holding power. However, um, this was not the end of the fighting. There was intermittent civil war um, through into the mid to late 90s, depending on how you define when that ended. Um, but most people date the kind of ultimate collapse of the Khmer Rouge um, to 1998 with Pol Pot's death and eventually the arrest of um, the last holdout, Tam Mok in and Long Vang. Um, and so you have this long period of time, right? Um, 1979, we saw that the Yugoslav tribunal the Rwanda tribunal, they were set up in kind of the immediate aftermath of the relevant atrocities, as was Nuremberg. Um, but here we have this long gap. Um, in 1997, a UN group of experts was created and kind of that marked uh, a long protracted negotiation period um, between the UN and, um, oops, I think I just paused my screen. Sorry, I just need to. Um, 
unpause this. Okay, sorry about that. Between the UN and Cambodia. Um, some of the major stumbling blocks, um, I'm not an expert on these very, very protracted negotiations. I have read some relatively exhaustive overviews provided by David Sheffer and um, Steve Heater. Um, and, but some of the major kind of overarching stumbling blocks in the design of the court, um, which we will see later on kind of come to manifest themselves in some of the problems uh, that the court uh, experienced were first, ultimately who's gonna control the court? Is this gonna be a domestic court that has some U uh, UN or international assistance? Is this gonna be primarily an international court um, that just perhaps engages some Cambodian actors? Um, so that's one major question. The second one, which um, ultimately proved a little less controversial, was the temporal jurisdiction, right? This is why I wanted to explain that there is a long history of quite severe atrocities involving not only Cambodia, but world powers, including the US in Cambodia around the time period leading up to and following the Khmer Rouge period. Um, but the choice was ultimately made, as we will see, um, to focus exclusively on the Khmer Rouge period. Um, and then the biggest question, and the one that I'm gonna focus on mostly because it has been the one that has proven to be um, the source of the most controversy and kind of questions about the legacy of the court was this question of how many, how many people is this court going to prosecute? Um, how far down the chain of command are they going to go? Um, and what is what is that going to look like, right? Um, so some of the ideas, um, there had been kind of eight people initially proposed by the Cambodian People's Party, which is the government that was in, was and remains in power in Cambodia, of eight kind of ringleaders. Then you had Doik, who I'm going to talk about a little bit later, who was the commandant of a very famous um, prison, but far from the only prison, um, Khmer Rouge era prison in Cambodia. And then questions of maybe some others. Um, <clears throat> So David Sheffer, who was the former U.S. ambassador for war crimes, um, I think the title has slightly shifted. Um, he wrote in his uh, memoir that uh, he was very involved in these negotiations. Um, he viewed it as a kind of stubbornness of U.N. lawyers and diplomats to compromise and a nationalistic ins insularity of Cambodian officials who wanted to make sure they controlled the court. Um, in the view from the outset in 2012, although in some more recent writing, um, David Sheffer has evinced perhaps a little more skeptical views. Um, he's, he was of the view um, writing uh, a book that was published at least in 2012, that the end result was a credible institution um, that meets at least on paper in his view at that time, right? Um, adherence to international standards of due process. Um, so the court ultimately, um, the ultimate compromise, the court was created pursuant to a bilateral treaty between Cambodia and the United Nations as a whole. Um, it was created as a hybrid institution. It was nominally and well, as it closes down, is housed as a quote unquote extraordinary chamber. So that's where its name comes from. Um, of the existing Cambodian judicial system. So it's a special chamber of the Cambodian judiciary. Um, it is, and the compromise was that it was staffed by Cambodian and international judges, lawyers, and staff. So every position, um, there would be a Cambodian national um, filling that position, and then an international counterpart um, with both of them ostensibly having um, equal and coterminous powers and they're supposed to work together. So there was a national co-prosecutor and an international co-prosecutor. Um, within the judicial makeup of the court, um, there were multiple chambers. Um, it was a civil law-based system with investigating judges. So there was a national and interna international co-investigating judge. Um, and then pretrial, trial, and Supreme Court chambers with the Supreme Court chamber being the highest appellate chamber. Um, those were all made up of panels of judges, and each of those involved um, a Cambodian majority of judges, um, but there was a convoluted system whereby for any decision to be binding and final, 
um, it, it had to be signed on to by a supermajority, which essentially meant in practice that at least one international judge had to sign on to any decision if um, assuming that the Cambodian judges voted as a bloc, um, that decision would not have any effect unless at least one international judge signed on. So these controversial questions about jur jurisdictional mandate, um, the temporal jur jurisdiction ultimately was strictly limited to the day, to the Khmer Rouge period. So specifically 17th of April to the 6th of January, 1979. Um, so that meant the court had no competence to address crimes that occurred before that. So nothing to do with the civil war that I mentioned, um, had no jurisdictional competence um, and nothing that happened after January 1979. So any alleged atrocities or international crimes that occurred during the civil war that followed the fall of the regime. The subject matter the court was tasked uh, with addressing um, was also a little bit less controversial. Um, it had a list of enumerated international crimes, um, primarily crimes against humanity, um, war crimes, and genocide. Um, it also was empowered to prosecute, prosecute existing domestic crimes um, from the Cambodian Penal Code, which ostensibly remained in effect during the Khmer Rouge period. It was the penal code passed in the um, 50s that was a legacy uh, essentially a French penal code um, that was adopted after independence. And so the court did have the power to prosecute certain crimes, um, such as murder, as domestic offenses. And then the most controversial component of the court's jurisdictional mandate was the ultimate um, answer to this question of how many and who are we going to decide who the court is going to have the power to prosecute. Um, Again, this was the subject of protracted negotiations. It's very clear that the UN side was not at all comfortable of having like a specific number of people. Um, and that the idea was that we're gonna kind of punt this forward and let the court determine it by saying that the court has jurisdiction over senior, former senior Khmer Rouge leaders or other individuals um, who are considered in, in the words, um, the operative words appearing in um, the agreement and the applicable ECCC law is individuals considered, quote, most responsible um, for the crimes committed during the Khmer Rouge era. And this term, most responsible, um, as I'm sure many of you can, can even see at first glance, um, is not the most precise term um, and has been the source of considerable controversy. Um, so, <clears throat> Ultimately, the court initiated investigations in four cases involving a total of nine suspects. The first two cases, cases one and two, um, all of the everyone was on board with at the court. So the national and international co-prosecutors initiated the investigation, passed it off to the two co-investigating judges who issued indictments, and those cases went to trial. Um, initially, those two cases together involved five suspects. So Doik was the sole suspect in case one. Um, and then case two initially involved the most senior former Khmer Rouge officials alive at the time, um, who were Nunchia, often referred to as brother number two, or Pol Pot's kind of second in command, Q Sampan, who was the um, nominal head of state at the time, the prime minister during the Khmer Rouge era. Uh, Ying Seri, who was in um, the standing committee, the highest committee and held various functions. And his wife, Ying Tirit, who was a minister. Um, I think the minister for social affairs at the time. Um, <clears throat> only three of these individuals survived long enough. So they're all quite all elderly at the time the trial started. Um, Ying Seri and Ying Tirit um, both died before a trial judgment. Um, and Doik, Nunchia, and Q Sampan um, lived large enough for trial judgments. Um, and in the case of Nunchia, who has since passed away, um, some of the appeals process and Doik survived through the appeals process and was and um, died in prison a couple of years ago. So ultimately, Q Sampan, um, who we have pictured here in 2014, is the lone current survivor 
um, who was prosecuted at the court as it winds down. Um, so that leaves cases three and four. Um, so both of these cases were very controversial from the outset. And in my view and in some of my research, I argue that the treatment of these cases um, creates the potential um, for the ECCC having a negative, not just no kind of positive effect on the rule of law in contemporary Cambodia, but a kind of potentially negative legacy, at least in this arena, right? Um, so these cases involved a total of four suspects. Um, they were um, opposed by the Cambodia People's Party, the regime currently in power from their outset. Um, and that perception of that monolithic opposition um, has continued. Um, and they were also practically composed, uh, opposed um, by the Cambodian staff at the court, um, most notably the Cambodian investigating judge and the Cambodian co-prosecutor, as well as judges on the pretrial and trial and uh, um, Supreme Court chambers, all in unison oppose the case court, the cases moving forward. Um, so ultimately those cases did not move forward. The court has wound down. They all reached some variation of a procedural impasse um, with an ultimate decision that they could not move forward and a, a statement of the court um, in, a vari in, in various formats that essentially saying that these cases will not move forward. Um, and with that backdrop, the court has ceased active operations. It will only deal with certain appeals issues moving forward. Um, and um, now there's been this long um, simmering debate has kind of come forward as folks start shifting from looking at what the court is doing to assessing its legacy um, and, and what can we learn from this court and did it do anything worthwhile? So I think it's helpful to frame this. There was a 2022 article, a brief article written by Alex Hinton, who is another expert. He testified before the court and has written several books, um, both about the Khmer Rouge period, um, but also about the court itself and transitional justice in Cambodia. And I think it's helpful just as a framing that he kind of divides um, views that he view, he thinks are, are differing and help explain why people have these different views of the court into three categories. So the legal purists, um, for him, um, they define success as being wholly focused on a kind of scrupulous adherence to applicable laws, kind of regardless of outcome. So a kind of legal proceduralist perspective, um, very rule of law oriented. Um, and then he views the progressivists um, largely as focused on what are often referred to as transitional justice goals, um, this is a quote of turning post-authoritarian countries into democracies governed by the rule of law and human rights. And then he says there's also the pragmatist, um, which is where he lumps himself. Um, and he says, you know, it's not really uh, judging success and, and looking and assessing legacy. We should be looking um, to whether these institutions, such as the ECCC, achieved modest achievements um, that, that can help a post-conflict society attain a measure of justice. And he mentioned some specific things. Um, he said even limited accountability may be worthwhile, combating atrocity or genocide denial, deterrence of future atrocities and clarification of the historical ref record. Um, I think this is a helpful framing, but what I wanna do in the remainder, remaining 10 to 15 minutes is offer some thoughts on why I think, you know, some of these progressivist goals, right, of uh, kind of improving conditions in contemporary Cambodia in this context um, need to be kind of read as not being a kind of either no effect and no effect being a lack of success or a positive effect and that being success that I think there's another up. Uh, possibility that is oft neglected, um, which is a negative effect. Um, and I am of the view that there's a risk that appears to be being realized that the court, while I, I grant that it may have some pragmatic successes or has done some things worthwhile, um, we, we have to keep in mind that it may, in my view, have had ultimately or may prove to have um, 
a negative effect on the rule of law in contemporary Cambodia. And there's the, a risk there that we should take seriously um, and that we should kind of put into our calculus of, of thinking through what the kind of social life is of this court kind of now um, and for contemporary Cambodia. Um, so when it comes to rule of law improvements, I know this is a lot of text on the screen, um, but I thought this quotation really encapsulated kind of two ways in which um, tribunals and especially on-site tribunals that are supposed to operate in post-conflict countries with the participation of local actors um, is, are, is supposed to improve the rule of law, right? In, in, in those sites. So there's kind of two effects that, this is a quote from the uh, OHCR's Cambodia website, um, two effects claimed, right? One is a demonstration or a kind of expressivist effect um, that the court can serve this somewhat didactic function um, to the local population and to folks uh, in Cambodia watching the court at, here's how a court should operate. Here's how a court should follow basic kind of fair trial standards and, and express positive rule of law norms, right? Um, and the other is capacity building, all right? This is how the court through engaging local actors can help train people, help improve their skills, can, can transfer knowledge and best practices um, kind of directly to actors in the domestic system, most notably within the domestic legal system. Um, and where I, while I think those potentials are, are very much real, um, I have worries that the inverse may have happened and be in the process of happening in Cambodia. Um, and I'm gonna explain uh, what those are. So to understand that, right, um, to understand this relationship between this tribunal um, and the rule of law in Cambodia, I think we need to understand a little bit about the rule of law deficit in contemporary Cambodia and the pressures that are at play, right? So Cambodia had never had an opportunity to really develop its own indigenous legal system. Um, but also um, it has been under the control of the CPP essentially uh, since 1979. Um, the Vietnamese installed People's Republic of Kampuchea regime um, was made up of um, largely former Khmer Rouge defectors who had gone over to the crossed the border into Vietnam and were with the Vietnamese when they re-entered, when they entered and took control of Cambodia, um, and then were their hand-picked government. And that PRK regime has evolved over time into the current Cambodia People's Party, led for over three decades now by Hun Sen. Um, so there is an incentive for the um, CPP to um, at least have some appearance of abiding by the rule of law and respecting human rights. Um, recently, um, the government has become, made itself strategically less reliant on um, foreign aid from Western countries, including the US who had been a big donor, um, with a strategic shift toward China, which has um, resulted in a little less kind of oversight, but there are still um, incentives for the CPP to not too flagrantly violate kind of basic rule of law norms or human rights. Um, a few years ago, um, there were some crackdowns and it endangered, the, for as an example, the everything but arms deal that Cambodia has with certain EU countries, which is a favorable trade agreement, right? Um, but the CPP is also invested in a certain narrative of itself as the savior and its members and leaders as the saviors of Cambodia, as the group of people who ultimately effectively stripped power from the Khmer Rouge um, and rescued Cambodia from the scourge of the Khmer Rouge while the international community kind of sat idly by or even worse, um, kind of helped the Khmer Rouge due to Cold War politics. I'm happy to talk about that as well. Um, and to do this, we need to understand the kind of CPP rule by law playbook. Um, so in recent years, the CPP has increasingly used law as a tool through which 
to exercise power and consolidate further power in itself. It has done this through these kind of formalist reforms and in doing so, inserting carefully areas of ambiguity and discretion in laws, and then using those areas and their control over the people who interpret and enforce these laws to use these laws as both a sword um, and a shield, all right? Um, so as a result, inconsistent kind of mutually incompatible results are common um, and laws are used to crack down on dissent. So often criminal laws are used, defamation, public insult, treason more recently, um, and vague incitement laws are used. Um, uh, one example is recently um, various people who work for Mother Nature Cambodia, which is a, um NGO, uh, uh, environmental NGO that often um, had critiqued the government and its environmental record. Um, uh, six members were charged with criminal uh, offenses and then the charges against them, they were released without the charges being dismissed as a way of kind of stifling their speech. Um, they used tax laws to shut down the Cambodian daily, uh, daily, which is one of the last remaining kind of independent news outlets. And there's been some more recent acti activity in this area. So they're kind of using law strategically um, to grant themselves new power. Also during COVID, um, they passed an, a new emergency powers law which had a very vague provision, they could activate at almost any time to declare a state of emergency and grant themselves um, essentially martial law powers. So that has not, to my knowledge, been, um, in, uh, been invoked yet, but is a risk that is kind of always floating around. So that brings us, and I'll close with a few thoughts on why I think cases three and four and the conundrum about those cases matters to contemporary rule of law issues in Cambodia. Um, so these cases involved suspects outside of the absolute top echelon of the Khmer Rouge regime. They were, as a reminder, publicly opposed by the regime, the CPP regime. Um, some people have suggested that they could muddy the waters of this kind of quote unquote clean rescue narrative um, by implicating some people who may have held similar degrees of power as current CPP members when they were in the Khmer Rouge regime. Um, but regardless of, in, of the uh, overall motives, the very clear public statements by Hun Sen and other elites within the CPP has been, these cases are not going to be quote unquote permitted to move forward. And then the national actors at the court have operated in lockstep to effectuate that. So what resulted was a sharp national international split among judges as well as some staff members um, and this procedural impacts. Um, and why I think this is very troubling for the rule of law is because you have the problem of Doik. Um, Doik was not a senior leader. He was most responsible, right? That's one of the reasons most responsible was included was because Doik was in prison when they were negotiating this court and they didn't know what to do with him and they thought we have to prosecute him at this court. So he was the commandant of the most visible but by mo no means largest prison in terms of numbers of victims um, in Khmer Rouge era Cambodia, Cambodia. And he argued in his appeal that he was, the court didn't have jurisdiction over him because he was neither a senior leader nor most responsible. The Supreme Court chamber largely ducked this issue and they did so um, by finding that this language was quasi-legal in terms of it being um, a guide for the exercise of prosecutorial discretion, but one that was subject to a good faith analysis. And so they implicitly found that um, one could conclude Doik was um, either a senior leader and or most responsible, um, and this would be within the bounds of good faith. Um, and so the problem there, and I know there's a lot of text, we can return to this and talk about individual suspects, is that every single one of the suspects in cases three and four were both at a higher level of authority within the Khmer Rouge power hierarchy um, than Doik. And there's pretty good evidence that has been well-documented um, and cited by a judge in dissent um, that they are... Res likely responsible for far more deaths than Doik. 
right? Personally responsible in a criminal sense. And there's a lot of evidence. And so the result is that you have these people who by any measure, right? Um, and the term most responsible um, does have legal meaning within international criminal law. It's typically some combination of a relative assessments of directness of responsibility and gravity of harms involved. But no matter how you approach those questions, um, it's kind of inescapable that Doik is um, not more responsible than these individuals and not um, a higher level leader. Um, and so the result, um, although you had this kind of social visibility of the prison, S21, that Doik ran, um, is that once Doik has been prosecuted, it's a it's a fundamentally, in my view, incompatible result um, based on publicly available evidence and even evidence cited in court documents um, to not find that the suspects in cases three and four are also among those most responsible. Um, and so there's a fundamental problem there. And the court um, and was faced with this problem and this opposition. Um, and my concern is that um, the pretextual shuttering of these cases, um, specifically these cases, which were very high profile because they were so controversial, um, both produced negative versions of those effects that I, I mentioned earlier that the OHCHR in Cambodia was kind of advertising as potential positive outcomes for the court, right? That there could, that shutting down these cases sent some very troubling kind of expressivist messages emanating from the court to the Cambodian population who may have been watching the court. Um, examples are that manifestly inconsistent outcomes are permissible under the law and this happens a lot in contemporary Cambodia a law is interpreted one way and then the opposite way in different cases depending on power dynamics the same provision um, that it is perhaps okay and that the rule of law can tolerate um, that powerful individuals for example Hun Sen and other CPP officials can be the ultimate arbiters of legal disputes right what is the meaning of most responsible most responsible essentially Hun Sen and the CPP decided in this case um, and the notion that legality and the rule of law is simply an empty formalism it simply means using specific magical language that is legal in nature without any kind of co procedural consistency or coherency within it. Um, and on top of that, the idea that this is approved by the UN, the UN is participating in this, this is the international community, um, and this court is actively held up as the kind of model to be followed. Um, so in terms of social messaging, um, I have that concern. And then I have this second concern, which we have seen um, examples of, of what I refer to as negative capacity building, which is that the actors at the court, many of them are beholden to the CPP and people who are engaging with the court, there's kind of two groups of people. There are people who may go out on afterwards to a life of activism, right? Um, and some people have tried to use the, the skills they've learned from the court and become activists, they have largely been stifled, ostracized, and forced to flee, um, versus people who engaged at the court who essentially were trained how to create more convincing facades of legality, right? How to jump through empty procedural hoops in order to appease, say, donor states um, and not anger them. Um, and I'm concerned that um, the result could be and appears to be a kind of more sophisticated kind of shell game of hiding the ball when it comes to constructing um, these empty facades of legality to cover up um, rule by law tactics, which are clearly tactics that the government is becoming more sophisticated at using and is using with more regularity. Um, and so that's the specific concern I have about legacy. And of course, there are some positive things that come from the court starting conversations can be one. Um, there's not a lot of good evidence for deterrence generally with ICL. Um, but, you know, having these conversations um, 
debating the historical record. I, I'm not saying that there's nothing good coming from the court, but my concern is that um, it's not just good things and and kind of neutral things, that we have to look more capaciously and really concern ourselves with risks. And, and I'm not convinced that we're doing that as much as we should. So I'll leave it there. Um, sorry, I know that was a, a giant overview, but I'm, I'm hoping that we can have a conversation. I'm happy to return to any of the kind of issues I glossed over and dive in in any depth that people are interested in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Render. Uh, can you turn off the share screen? Or oh, yeah, absolutely. It is a wonderful presentation on the HCCC, and your presentation explained from the creation of the system, it's a working and the uh, uh, implications. And uh, it's very uh, good to hear your assessment of the uh, last uh, cases. In fact, uh, as you know, uh, international uh, tribunal on Yugoslavia and Rwanda were criticized for it mm -hmm. being international because uh, it was located in Hague or Arsha and uh, the judges, prosecutors or foreigners. And uh, the involvement of uh, actual uh, human rights victims were minimal. And mm -hmm. it's, it's very hard to bring the witness to Hague or Arsha, foreign country. And uh, Differently from those uh, complete international tribunal, uh, this uh, Khmer Rouge tribunal actually allowed uh, uh, local victims to uh, participate in the process. And uh, uh, however, as you indicated, there has been uh, some kind of uh, compromises made mm -hmm. among actors. So uh, in the past, uh, when uh, truth and reconcil reconciliation were uh, issues were everywhere in especially in South Africa there was a discussion debate among forgive and forget versus mm -hmm. prosecute and punish punishment mm -hmm. and uh, transitional justice itself basically is a kind of a measures and uh, approaches to take when a regime authoritarian or non normal uh, regimes be, uh, mm -hmm. changing into normal regimes right and so in some country uh, it has been really kind of a thorough but in other country it was not and uh, uh, we see a lot of countries are still kind of uh, uh, discussing the best way to achieve uh, this transitional justice so mm -hmm. my initial question uh, to you is uh, this uh, who should be the decision maker in mm. finding out the best you know mechanism for the country that's a so the, <laughs> that's a big question I'll, I'll offer a few preliminary thoughts and i'll uh i think i'll slightly punt because <laughs> i don't think i should be the decision maker is a is a kind of my first answer um so i think interestingly yeah the the attempt to involve victims, I think, was a very worthwhile attempt in Cambodia. I think it also showed that it's really hard to do. So there was issues with, you know, people had to apply to be civil parties and then had to show certain harms and they had to show connections to the harms being addressed in these very limited prosecutions. So there was issues of kind of this inevitable hierarchy of victimhood when anyone who's Cambodian who lived in Cambodia from 1975 to 1979 is clearly a victim of an international crime, including most people who are in the Khmer Rouge, right, due to all the purges and whatnot. Um, and so there was issues around that, right? Uh, outreach was really tough. I was there at the time. Uh, the organization I worked at helped people fill out civil party applications, among other things. Um, and so there, it was really hard to kind of get people and then, you know, to have legal representation was an issue because there was these groups of civil parties and they're not all going to agree. Right. And so taking instruction was also a difficult thing for civil party lawyers, because understandably, there's going to be a broad range of different views um, um, among the civil parties. And then conversely, there were some kind of equality of arms decision uh, uh, complaints made by the defense, because I was at hearings where 
you know, there's kind of one third time for the prosecution, one third for the civil parties, and then one third for defense. And the civil parties largely in some and many hearings kind of supported and buttressed the prosecution's position. Um, and so the, there were some concerns about equality of arms issues um, for the defense there where they're saying, you know, this this is essentially a, a kind of second bite at the apple at the prosecution. So I think it's hard. I think it is worthwhile in trying to involve victims. But I think the decision making process um, needs to generally be more re, um, responsive and less prescriptive. Um, so here you had a group of experts who went in with kind of preset notions on what they're looking for in terms of what the crimes were and what what gets prosecuted kind of dictates who counts as a victim. Um, and that did not, and then what the court addressed did not always in my experience in kind of dealing with survivor populations. And it, I was often in a role of explaining, um, they could ask questions about the court and I would do my best to explain. Um, the concerns I was hearing about the topics that people wanted to be addressed, living conditions primarily, famine, things like that, were more at the background of the court rather than at the foreground. And I think that in the design phase, I think the more input you can get from directly affected communities um, in the design phase is incredibly important. Uh, and so who gets to make that decision, I think, should be primarily the people most directly affected. But I think that even goes to the institutional design phase um, to the extent that's that's feasible or possible. Thank you very much. Actually, I have uh, another related question, but I can wait because we have a very interesting uh, question uh, submitted through our uh, Q&A tab. And uh, actually it is uh, uh, Sara Paulim, and she asked us about uh, related issue, who determined the five suspects for the prosecutions? And uh, she mm -hmm. has some personal story to share about her uh, relative. So mm -hmm. Sarah, do mm -hmm. you want to speak yourself? Great, no, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, oh. and I have read your question. I'm, oh, I'm happy to discuss. Thank you, it was really nice. Uh, so, my name is Sarah Pollum. I work as executive director of UCC for a while during the ECC and supporting mm -hmm. that process. Uh, my question relate to the um, the suspect. Uh, you did mm -hmm. mention those five on the list, mm -hmm. but I also heard you saying that a number of uh, suspects that eight to nine. I wonder uh, what controversial behind. Uh, neurodomsy at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. A lot of folk, a survivor, and I'm a young survivor as well, was relating mm -hmm. to the fact that if it was not for his uh, radio announcement in support of the Khmer Rouge, at the time that a uh, professional, a lot of family member who uh, work in the military that already came mm -hmm. here in the US, as well as in France, they volunteered to go back because mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. uh, announcement and completely uh, believe in in Rodam Sihanu. And I uh, hear from all of my elder and family member that he should be the responsible party as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so that's, yeah, that's a very, you know, Nordam Sihanouk is a is a massive figure in Cambodian history, right? The the father of independence, the premier, the king who became prince, who became premier, who then you know was opposed to the Khmer Rouge, then allied with them, and then <laughs> under house arrest. Um, and yeah, so yeah, that is a very controversial question. As far as I know, he was never actually like there was no active consideration that he would ever be prosecuted at this tribunal. Um, although I can say, um, I have a, f I, I, I don't wanna overstate my experience, um, but I have had, I have said on numerous interviews with former Khmer Rouge members. And what you're saying, I think rings true in, in two ways. So first, um, a lot of people 
who wanted to, that's why I wanted to mention the temporal, the time period jurisdiction of the court, because a lot of people were of the view that by looking strictly at what happened from April 17th, 1975 onwards, that we lost a lot of what allowed this to happen. Um, and, and focusing on things such as, um, yeah, so um, for context, the king um, from China went on the radio in the 70s after the coup and called for Cambodians to go to the forest, join the resistance, and fight the Lundahl regime, who was an imperialist American lackey, um, which in my view was a true, a true statement about Lundahl. Um, he was U.S. sponsored, and there's pretty good evidence that the U.S. knew about the coup and at least tacitly accepted it, if not actively promoted it. Um, and so a lot of people have said the combination of that indiscriminate U.S. bombing. So people, a lot of people were drawn to the resistance because their village was bombed, right? So they fled and their way to fight back is to join the resistance. Um, so that the bombing combined with that call to arms by the king um, were really what turned the Khmer Rouge. It was a ragtag group of maybe at most 5,000 strong fighters. And it wasn't just the Communist Party, it was just these kind of various freedom fighter groups, um, that that's what swelled their ranks and that's what really gave them power. And so we need to look at the culpability of other people, um, the king being incredibly, incredibly controversial one, um, uh, but also, you know, Nixon and Kissinger in the US and their role with the bombing, which was illegal, hidden from Congress, and involve war crimes that were pretty clear because about 10% of the targets were listed as unknown. So it was indiscriminate, kind of no targeting, um, classic war crime, right? So yeah, those are very controversial. And getting back to interviews with former perpetrators, um, time and time again, they said they joined the Khmer Rouge because the king told them to go to the jungle and fight. Um, I know that over time, and speaking with my Cambodian colleagues who had done more of these interviews than me, this has become the kind of go-to, more acceptable reason, right? So it's not really clear whether that's the true motivation for everyone, um, but it definitely was an important factor, and I think it raises some really complicated questions about responsibility and culpability. But when it comes to actual um, discussions about potential prosecutions, um, the king, in my, uh, to my knowledge, was never viewed as a potential prosecutorial target. But thanks for your, for your question and for sharing. Thank you, Render. Very nice uh, and useful answer. Actually, one of the interesting dimensions of the ECCC is the existence of the civil party lead core lawyers, uh, of so-called CPR. Mm -hmm. I understand a group of uh, 3,866 civil parties have been engaging in the process during the trial stage and, and also beyond. So can you exp uh, introduce a little bit about the roles of uh, civil parties and also this uh, lead call lawyers? And uh, I think it is very interesting because uh, this, uh, this reflect the uh, French legal system. French often mm -hmm. with the criminal law matter in conjunction with the civil law compensation at the same time mm -hmm. in one trial. So I was wondering whether their role was really uh, kind of satisfactory in addressing people's concern and were they really useful, useful and effective in terms of a procedural you know, aspect? Yeah, so the civil parties, um... Like I mentioned earlier, there was many practical challenges presented by doing this and even in taking direction. There were some civil parties, um, including them, uh, Amer my American activist, Thierry Singh, who, who kind of quit and very publicly and, and said she was done with the process. So there were some civil parties who quit in protest, but others who didn't. Um, so the civil law component of it um, I think in some ways it worked. I do, having sat in on a lot of the hearings, I do really hear the defense concerns about equality of arms and time um, because the civil parties were much more aligned with the prosecution. And there, it was, a, you get, get a sense that there was more time being dedicated to talking 
um, kind of advocating on one side, right, um, than the other. Um, the court was limited to symbolic and collective reparations, which mm -hmm. I think, you know, was out of necessity, right? So in one way, it's it's just like a really hard situation, right? You have 3,000, I think you mentioned 3,866 total civil parties, right? Um, which is a lot. But then also, you know, you have a potential pool of several million people who would qualify, right? And so those civil parties are the ones who are kind of steering the process. Um, and there's a couple civil parties who are more well known than others, most notably two survivors of tool slaying prison, um, Chum Mei and Bu Meng. Um, and it, those two individuals, you know, wrote books and, you know, made money from those books and, and got a lot of attention, others less. So when it came to questions of figuring out who's going to speak and give testimony, I think that you'd have to ask the civil party lawyers, but I cannot imagine it was an easy process. Um, and some civil party lawyers expressed um, frustration with not being allowed to advocate for their clients in the way their clients wanted to, in terms of their clients wanting to raise issues or express things that were deemed at different times by judges of mostly the trial chamber, but judges of different chambers as being too extraneous and kind of outside the purview of proceedings. Um, and I think that raised some questions about what's the purpose of civil parties and civil parties in the litigation process um, and how much leeway they should have, again, with these kind of fair trial concerns, if they're kind of bringing in extraneous evidence that might sway things. Um, when it comes to the civil law setup, um, I think it's a nice idea that at least in this instance, the efficiency component did not work particularly well. And that being that in the civil law system, the judge, to, uh, an investigating judge has carriage of an investigation, not a prosecutor. And partially the, the names of the people being investigated are supposed to be kept out of the limelight to protect people's privacy if they're never indicted. So you had this very strange situation in Cambodia with cases three and four, where literally millions of people knew the names of the people being investigated, but no one was allowed to say their names. Um, and there was both long investigations by the prosecution, followed by long investigations by the investigating judges, followed by long trials. Whereas the civil system, the trial is supposed to be short because the judges have already done the investigation. So I could envision a way that of adapting a civil law system, maybe that would give us some of those benefits. But in this scenario, at least, it didn't really seem to 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 work out. Of course, the ICC has a civil party component as well um, that is not exactly the same as the ECCC, but is still kind of being tinkered with. Um, but my understanding with the um, trust fund for victims, there's more opportunity for more material direct reparations projects. Whereas in Cambodia, um, I think that diffused some of the controversy because you can imagine only the civil parties being eligible for kind of material reparations. That would create some real friction among survivor communities if they're getting things like money or material benefits um, about who qualifies and how those choices are made. Who covered the funds to sustain this enterprise? <laughs> the court? Yeah. So that was another one of the critiques of the court. It was all donor-based. Mm -hmm. um, so it was the, the, the tribunal model, model of you know, donor-based funding. Obviously, Cambodia kicked in some funding, but they were not the main funder. They do not, frankly, have the money to, to do it. It ended up costing well over $300 million or far, I think much more than that, but that's the number that's in my mind. Um, and so one of the issues that was going around was that the court was perpetually in a funding crisis, perpetually in a, we need funding or we're going to shut down. And then it was like emergency funding. So Japan provided a lot of funding, the US, um, uh, Germany, other Western European countries. Um, I think Korea provided some funding. I don't, not sure quite how much it was. Um, but those are the major donors. Um, but this donor-based justice system did create these repeated things where we don't, and there was times when salaries were not getting paid on time, um, including to national staff who were very much 
reliant on their salaries. Um, and there were some bribes and kickback controversies that I think partially stemmed from this uncertainty. Um, so the funding was another <laughs> perpetual issue, <laughs> like many of these courts. Yeah, for the audience, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to uh, write your question uh, on the Q&A tab, and we will uh, follow uh, with the, the written part uh, if it's necessary. And if you are interested in speaking, we can let you speak. Uh, as you know, I'm from South Korea, and uh, mm -hmm. we have experienced uh, a lot of uh, human rights uh, violations and atrocities the last 100 mm -hmm some years. And uh, uh, during this transitional uh, period from authoritarian regime to democracy, we have seen more than 17 uh, trust commission or other mm. uh, mechanisms. Uh, former presidents, two presidents were actually prosecuted and served some term and a lot of uh, civil compensation had gone through. Uh, I understand in Cambodia, this criminal procedure uh, to indict uh, some of the ring leaders of the, uh, the most responsible people, but uh, it does not mean that all of the justice had been fully served. And uh, mm -hmm. what, are hap what is happening for those ordinary people who really need some type of compensation, some kind of clearing their names or other mm -hmm. human rights measures? Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, there there have been some other mechanisms and processes, um, nothing that I think even comes close to covering the totality of the harms. So as an, as an initial matter, um, I, I vividly recall going to a meeting um, with a UN functionary um, in the fiat, in you know the guarantee of like truth, justice, and non-reoccurrence. Uh, I think it was a special rapporteur talking about reparations and being like our official position is that everyone's entitled to full reparations, which is kind of the international law position. And in Cambodia, where you have multiple millions of direct direct victims, right, survivors, who the harms, if you even try to like you know under tort law approximate monetary harms to rebuild their lives would be orders of magnitude greater than the GDP of Cambodia, right? It would be probably, I have no idea, but you know, an almost infinite amount of money in, <laughs> in, my, uh, in my mind. And so you have this problem where you have a country where the harms that people directly saw, suffered is greater than the net resources of the country. Um, so I think that's, that's a major issue. I, I can't speak to Korea, but you know, being a, a wealthier nation, there's at least some resources there with, I, I would guess, smaller kind of directly affected victim populations. Um, in 1979, the PR, People's Republic of Kampuchea regime did hold a trial in absentia of Nunchi, uh, sorry, um, Ying Siri and Pol Pot, wi widely derided as a show trial, but it did happen. And there was also something um, called the Renaxi petitions, where people went around and it was like, it was essentially somewhat similar to an informal truth commission process where people um, famously, you know, gave their fingerprint as their signature and talked about the harms they suffered and this was collected and memorialized. So there has been efforts at collective um, symbolic reparations and memorialization type processes, um, but the needs are very, very real in Cambodia. Um, especially with um, two things and two areas that are of pressing concerns now. The existing survivor population is very rapidly, even the people who are children aging into old age and are experiencing kind of worse health outcomes directly tied to their experiences as victims, right? Um, so um, including physical and mental health issues and there's not a lot of care there. And I know that where I used to work, the documentation center, this is a major thing that they're trying to get, trying to address in whatever way they can by providing kind of direct health outreach to survivor, especially kind of elderly survivor populations as a form of justice. Um, and they're trying to get resources and they're having some success in these areas. But it's very, you know, anytime it's a local actor just trying to step into the void, it's very scattershot. 
And of course, they're going to suffer from in, insufficient resources. And then the second issue is intergenerational trauma, right? And this, this um, uh, uh, a friend of mine who uh, named Carrie Wiggum wrote a book called Resonant Violence that talks about the way unaddressed mass violence and the harms resonate and evolve and change over time, but don't dissipate. Um, and I think that Cambodia is a, is a is an example of of this, where harms are very severe, and we have in mounting data that these harms are intergenerational when it comes to these mass trauma harms. Um, and so this is not going to just go, I mean, go away once the direct survivor population kind of ages out. Um, and is we no longer have them with us, right? This is something that is going to need addressing. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of the things Cambodia generally needs um, are what these same populations need when it comes to healthcare, um, access to mental and physical health care, mental health and physical health, um, and access to stability um, and jobs and and the ability to provide for themselves. So. Um, lots of work to still be done. Um, I know there's some mechanisms kind of being pushed. I think it's a little tough because the CPP is very invested in this kind of rescue narrative. And for them, the ECCC was kind of the exclamation point or sent it period on that, right? Um, Hun Sen famously said, you know, other than the court, we're going to, you know, dig a hole and bury it in referring to to this history of atrocity. Um, and so there's various monuments that have been made to the CPPs, um, to the CPP and memorializing victims, but it's all treated as a kind of thing past and we're like moving forward, pivoting away from that. And I don't think that that is necessarily the case when it comes to the needs of, of victim populations. But if you have ideas, to, I'm happy to hear them. <laughs> Yeah, in, in fact, when I visited Sri Lanka after the domestic conflict between uh, Singhalese, the major uh, government and uh, LTT uh, rebel groups, uh, I was surprised as a UN delegation, we found that there were very few memorials available. Mm -hmm. Only, I, I think, except for the glory uh, kind of monuments to mm -hmm. realized uh, governmental forces. Uh, kind of success. Mm -hmm. uh, the victim uh, related memorials are very, very limited. And especially because the civil society didn't have any money to establish any kind yeah. of <laughs> meaningful thing. Uh, we, I, I felt how it's uh, really problematic because they don't even have uh, their cemetery for the victims. They don't even have uh, some forensic mm -hmm. done to at least understand what had happened to the people. So in terms of the memorialization that are led by government, according to you, the government, the party is doing something. But what what do you think uh, is, uh, you know? Uh, yeah, I think this is a, it's a really interesting question. So a colleague of mine, um, Savina Sirik, um, she just finished a PhD. She worked, she's done amazing work. She's done like 10 years of field work with, um, you know, she's a survivor, but she's done like at least 10 years of field work with directly affected populations. And I've done some research writing with her. And um, she she wrote a really fascinating book on memorialization practices. And I think it's just called Landscapes of Violence, where she talks about grassroots kind of individual village level memorialization practices, especially in places where there's not like a former prison or a former obvious site of violence. And, and what so there are kind of grassroots local memorialization practices that do occur, right? Mm -hmm. Especially with Buddhist ceremonies and various um, pre-existing ceremonies where often, you know, that aren't, didn't arise after the Khmer Rouge period, but, um, you know, the souls of victims are venerated through these processes and memorialized. Um, but one of the interesting things about the government memorialization I read this really interesting paper by Alexander Kent, where she talked about um, how in recent years, there's been kind of even government capture of outreach by the court, where like money in the donor funding was dissipating for this court, and there was less money for outreach and kind of outreach usually involved bringing people to the capital and bringing them to the, to the 
and go taking them on a tour and then bringing them to the court. Um, and once the government got involved, part of the tour became these government monuments, um, including this famous win-win monument um, that I think was on my last slide, um, which were not on the tour and don't really have anything directly to do with Khmer Rouge history, but it was a, a monument to the government ending the conflict, right? And so you could see how the government, again, is very adept in manipulating um, kind of the 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 way this history is framed and memorialized, even through the court, in the way that it kind of shapes outreach. Um, but I I agree. I think you know, um, memorialization practices are important, um, and there are things that happen, um, but there's the major kind of most visible things are either these really visceral museums, um, which were kind of created as evidence of the barbarity of the Khmer Rouge regime, like, and they show a lot of human remains, and it's very, a very visceral experience to visit them, um, or are government led. And I think that that's really a kind of two notes, and that's really it when it comes to the public um, official memorial I mean, there was lots of talk at the court about our symbolic and collective reparations going to involve more memorialization practices. It hasn't, as to my knowledge, really produced that much. So in your book, Invisible Atrocity, I think you mentioned about the needs of the people more in depth, and especially mm -hmm. the poorer people. What do they in fact uh, need? Uh, in conjunction mm. with this past experience, um, collective experience. Yeah. So in the book, I tried to talk to to the extent I interpreted and it was narrated to me. Kind of the needs, I think, is a big can of words, but as more the the desires, right? Um, and those desires, that's kind of went back to the time I was talking about, um, kept being expressed to me. You know, the question in a kind of loose sense being, will they, they being the court, prosecute them, them being the former Khmer Rouge people, for X, Y, and Z, for starving us, for separating us from our family, for working us so hard, for not allowing us to take breaks, for not allowing us to practice our religion, to not allow us to do these things. And largely the court kind of dabbled with a few of those things on the side, but they didn't directly address it. Um, and those are the kinds of and a lot of those things, in my view, at least of my legal analysis, I'm of the view that some of them they could have addressed relatively head on, especially questions relating to famine and responsibility for deaths attributable to famine, um, which I think would have had um, an expressive value in terms of being a universal experience that everyone went through, right? Not every last person was imprisoned or necessarily beaten, but literally everyone who survived um, this period went through severe deprivation of food and and including those who survived often had to watch family members slowly deteriorate, which I th was a time and time again narrated to me as the worst harm. And, and, and so in the book, I was trying to discuss how we should be more reactive and trying to turn the existing tools we have to address the concerns of those people most directly affected. Um, rather than just prosecuting the easiest crimes or the most obvious crimes. And here that was kind of abuses at tool slaying in prisons and this kind of more spectacular forms of violence. But when it comes to the needs, they are they are many. Um, and I think healthcare is is really the big one. Um, Cambodia does not have a strong healthcare system and people are aging. Um, and it's largely just up to who has family and and what family can can do you know like can family care for the for, for this person um and, and we need more thank um, you very much yeah, any last questions <laughs> uh yes actually i think uh, uh it's it's a very good time for me to call the director of the center for southeast asian studies so that she can uh give a, a short comment on the contents of this presentation if she if she has any questions she might do after that Maybe, uh, Randall, you can uh, uh, finish this uh, presentation by your final uh, remark. So, okay. Miriam, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I, 
I'm not a specialist in law or in sociology. I'm an archaeologist, so my experience with Cambodia is very different. But everyone yes. who has worked in Cambodia has been touched by this. So I just wanted to thank you for this. And before Arandal and uh, Taeong finish up, I did want to say that we are um, co-hosting a colloquium tomorrow, which is not a webinar. It's only in person with Dr. Cynthia Fowler, who is the professor and chair of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Wolford College. She'll be talking about Buru Ura, Kandu Wayo, the dynamic links between freshwater ecosystems and social change on Sumba Island, Indonesia. So we're moving from politics in mainland Southeast Asia, the island Southeast Asia and political ecology. And uh, I, I welcome you to look at our website and find out about this or contact me. And I just wanted to say thank you. I'll let Randall and Peong finish up now. Thank you. Render final. Yeah, time. sure. I'll I'll tie up. I saw there was one question about genocide denial and the ECCC's relationship. Um, in my admittedly limited experience, it's not so. There's not so much a problem of denial in Cambodia in terms of you know atrocities or genocide did not happen. It's who's responsible, right? Is the big question, and uh, you know, even coming up with the you know the king, the U.S. Kissinger, the China is another major issue we didn't talk about. Um, Vietnam and the Vietnamese War, and previous incursions into Cambodia by Vietnam and taking territory. All these different. That's really, to me, the big question. I I never experienced a kind of situation where these things just didn't happen as as a classical form of denial. Um, but what I can say is people didn't, my understanding is people didn't really talk about it at all. And a lot of parents didn't talk about their experiences to children um, and whatnot. And it was not taught in schools. Um, it is now taught in schools. That is not necessarily a direct result of the ECCC. Um, there was a genocide education project that was teamed with the government um, to create a textbook. And now it is being taught. Um, and I think that in my view, is um, more responsive in terms of denial. Um, but there were some younger Cambodians who were just kind of completely um, oblivious because their family didn't talk about it and no one talked about it and they were very young. Um, but I think that the court has played some small role at least in, in helping to address that kind of blind spot um, in terms of genocide denial. Uh, and I'll, I'll just wrap up by saying I, I really appreciate everyone's time. Taeyong, thanks for the wonderful questions. I like to keep this dialogue going in some form, you know, next time I see you. Um, and uh, I, I am working on a paper along these lines. So anyone who did have thoughts, you know, you can find my email, email me. I'm more than happy to correspond, answer any other questions. Um, if you look me up, just send me an email at my UH email and I definitely will respond. And thanks for everyone's time. I hope that it was at least informative in some small way. <laughs> thank you very much, Render. I'd like to thank you again uh, for all of the audience, their uh, wonderful participation, and also for organizing this event, uh, uh, the director of the Center for Southeast Asian Studies and other people who had helped uh, behind the scene to make this happen. Actually, uh, I think this is uh, the beginning of the bigger uh, the discussions on the legacy of ECCC, and I hope uh, we will have uh, more discussion on this important matter in the future. Thank you again for your participation. Have a wonderful evening. Have a wonderful evening, everyone.